Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our, our current session of Facebook Live, our Bible study, as we uh, conduct session two of this great study. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's a privilege to come to you, to connect with you, to conduct this study and to look into the Word of God together. I'm so glad that you've joined me tonight. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we are so privileged to be able to study your word together. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Lord, I pray that you would illumine, illuminate its truths tonight and speak to us in a new and fresh way and help us to gain fresh insight into your word. Uh, speak to us, bless each one who is uh, viewing this and participating in this live stream and let our time be profitable tonight. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. It's great to get with you uh, as uh, you tune into the live stream tonight. Go ahead and uh, sign in. Uh, let me know. Let everyone know that you're here. I see Claudia has uh, signed in. Great to have you, Claudia. Claudia is usually the first one lately to sign in. Uh, I love the enthusiasm. Great to have you uh, with us tonight. So sign in as uh, you uh, tune in and uh, feel free to share your comments, your questions, your thoughts as we progress through the study tonight. This is session two of Chronicles, uh, the sixth and final volume of the Immerse Reading Bible. We began uh, last week, we uh, looked at a little bit of introductory material and then we began the actual text itself. One thing I do want to uh, repeat from last week or just remind us of from last week is that the books that we know in our Bibles as First and Second Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah, those four books were originally, as we learned last week, uh, combined into uh, one book. And so uh, we are uh, approaching it in that way, and uh, hence the name Chronicles. Last week, our study uh, and the beginning of the text uh, was, the material was mainly genealogies. Uh, that is ancestral uh, uh, trees of the people of Israel uh, going all the way back to Adam and going uh, forward. And... Uh, this week we'll actually get into some more narrative material. Now another thing that we did say last week that I want to remind you of is that um, some of the material here in Chronicles overlaps with First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, the material about David and his kingdom and his son Solomon and his kingdom. Uh, there's not a lot of material in uh, Chronicles about King Saul, a little bit here as we'll see at the beginning tonight, uh, but the focus is mainly on uh, David and Solomon. Uh, there uh, is overlapping information. Some of the same events are recorded in Chronicles as in uh, Samuel and Kings, uh, little different aspects of some of those events. And of course, there is unique material to Chronicles as well. So just want you to be aware of that. We did say one other thing I'll remind you of from last week is that this material was written many, many years later. It wasn't uh, contemporary, written con contemporaneously with the events as they happened, but was recorded many years later. All right. Well, tonight we pick up in uh, on page 20. In your text, if you have the text, and by the way, we have a couple more of the paperback volumes of Chronicles left at the Welcome Center at church. Uh, they're available for $10 a piece. Get yours uh, if you haven't yet uh, before they're gone. Uh, $10 a piece for the volume. But if you don't have the volume, you can follow along anyway. So we begin at the bottom of page 20, uh, which is uh, in the book we know as First Chronicles. Uh, the end of chapter 9, moving into uh, chapter 10. Now, it begins by telling us that the Philistines attacked Israel and the men of Israel fled before them. And this was when Saul was king of Israel. 
And uh, it says that the Philistines closed in on Saul. They killed three of his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchashua. You remember Jonathan was the one who was uh, very, very close friends with uh, David in his youth. They, were, they had a strong, strong bond. Well, Jonathan here was killed. And then it says the fighting grew fierce around Saul. The Philistine archers caught up to him and wounded him. And so he asks his armor bearer uh, to finish the job to, because he was wounded, he was gravely ill, and he wanted to end his suffering. Uh, and he asks the, the armor bearer, he says, to uh, kill me before the, the, these pagan Philistines come to taunt me and torture me. But the, archer, uh, the armor bearer, rather, it says, was afraid and would not do that. So Saul took his own sword, he fell on it, and he took his own life. And so a concluding statement to this paragraph says, Saul and his three sons died there together, bringing his dynasty to an end. Well, it was a short dynasty. He was the only king in it. Uh, normally in antiquity, uh, when a, a king died, uh, his kingship would pass on to his oldest son. And uh, that would have been the case with Saul. But as we saw in our study of uh, First and Second Samuel, Saul disobeyed God, and so God took the kingdom from him and from his line and would give it to David. Um, so it says that uh, when Israelites in the Jezreel Valley saw their army had fled and Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their towns and fled. Then it tells us that the next day the Philistines went out to strip the dead, uh, in other words, to take any uh, weapons or uh, personal possessions they might have on them uh, from the dead. Uh, they stripped off Saul's armor. They found Saul and his sons, and they stripped off Saul's armor and cut off his head. And it says they proclaimed the good news. From their perspective, it was good news that Saul, the, the king of their arch enemy Israel, that Saul was dead. And uh, they cut off his head. They took it back. Uh, home and they put it on a pike, they displayed it, and they proclaimed that uh, that Saul had been dead, their enemy had been defeated. It says, when everyone in Jabesh Gilead, uh, the town of in Israel, heard about everything the Philistines had done to Saul, their mighty warriors brought the bodies of Saul and his sons back to Jabesh, and they buried their bones there. So there's a concluding paragraph here that begins with this statement. So Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. We saw in a previous study that he had offered sacrifices when he became impatient for Samuel, the prophet, to come. And God rejected him for that. He consulted a medium uh, in uh, the Witch of Endor. And uh, he did various things to displease God. And so God took the kingdom from him. A really tragic uh, story because he was, uh, when, when Israel uh, wanted so badly to have a king and the Lord relented, uh, Saul was the chosen man to be the king, but he failed the Lord and the kingdom was taken from his family line. So David, of course, was uh, to become king. You remember Samuel had come to David's father's uh, house, Jesse's house, and David was the youngest of the brothers, and there Samuel anointed him to be king. Uh, paragraph here, two-thirds of the way down, there at Hebron, David made a covenant before the Lord with all the elders of Israel, and they anointed him king of Israel, just as the Lord had promised Samuel. Now, David became king of a portion of Israel in he Hebron and was king there. We're not told here in Chronicles, but we're, we're told from the earlier uh, books. Uh, he was king there for seven years. Uh, but now we're leading up to the time where he would become king over all Israel. David and all Israel, it says, went to Jerusalem. He captured the city uh, and uh, became known as the city of David. David, it says, had said to his troops, whoever is first to attack the Jebusites, and uh, it's, it says here Jerusalem was known as Jebus or Jebus, and uh, so Jebusites were the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Whoever is the first to attack the Jebusites will become commander of my armies. And it says, Joab, the son of David's sister, Zariah, was the first to attack. So he became the commander 
of David's armies. So uh, David's nephew, Joab, attacked first and became the commander of David's army. It says, David made the fortress his home, and that is, it is why it is called the city of David. And David became more and more powerful because the Lord of Heaven's armies was with him. Now, again, I'll, I'll refer periodically back to the accounts in Samuel and, and Kings uh, because they shed light on some uh, events here in Chronicles. Um, what we're not told here is that uh, Saul's son, Ishbosheth, uh, when Saul was killed, he claimed the kingship. And uh, he had in mind to ascend to the throne after his father, Saul. As I said, that was what usually happened. But God had chosen David and David's line uh, to assume the kingship. And so when it talks here in the next few pages about David becoming stronger and stronger and people from the various tribes of Israel going over to David's side, that's because there was this conflict between Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and, and the, the people of, of Israel, or many of them, and then David on the other side, who was becoming more and more powerful. Now, the next page is here, beginning on page 22, uh, have the record of David's mightiest warriors. And it refers to the 30 and then the 3. So there were 30 mighty men, and then within that there was a group of the 3 that they were the real inner circle. It mentions uh, Jeshabim, the Hakamite, uh, who was leader of the three, the mightiest warriors of David's men. Uh, next, it mentions Eleazar, son of Dodai, as another one of the three. Um, talks about when David was at the rock near the cave of Adullam, the Philistine army was camped in the valley of Rephaim. Uh, so they were opposite David and his men. And it recounts David remarking longingly to his men, Oh, how I love some of the, that good water from the well by the gate that is in Bethlehem. It says, So the three broke through the Philistine lines, drew some water from the well by the gate in Bethlehem, and brought it back to David. But then it says this, But David refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out as an offering to the Lord. God forbid that I should drink this, he exclaimed. The water is as precious as the blood of these men who risked their lives to bring it to me. Now you could say those men risked their lives to give David his wish and bring him that water uh, from uh, near, uh, near Bethlehem and uh, then he wouldn't drink it. He dumped it on the ground. How dare he do that? Uh, but uh, David did that because it was so sacred to him that he didn't feel worthy to drink that water. Um, it mentions uh, then Abishai, the brother of Joab, so another nephew of David. He was the leader of the 30. Um, he was the most famous of the 30 and was their commander, it says, though he was not one of the three. Okay. Then there also was Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant warder from uh, Kabzeel, did many heroic deeds, and it recounts one of them. On a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit and killed it. Uh, another time, armed only with a club, he killed an Egyptian warrior who was seven and a half feet tall and was armed with a spear as thick as a weaver's bean. So he was a big dude. And it says, deeds like these made Benaniah as famous as the three mighty warriors, even though he was not one of the three. So he was a mighty man. Then on page 23, there's a listing of David's mighty warriors, and it mentions, mentions I won't read them all, but it mentions Ashael, uh, Joab's brother. So another, still another um, nephew of uh of David's. We have the three brothers, Joab, Abishai, and uh, Ashael, all brothers. Uh, just want to point out to you about six lines up from the bottom of the page, one of the mighty men it mentions is Uriah the Hittite. Uh, that's uh, interesting a little bit later uh, in David's kingship. You remember 
Uriah was Bathsheba's husband, and David committed adultery with her and had Uriah killed. So Uriah was one of the mighty men uh, of David's. Uh, and then it, on 24, it mentions other men who were, uh, had joined David. So, so David had mighty men and he, 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 he was, he had not yet conquered all Israel, uh, or, or become king over all Israel, but he had mighty men, uh, and, uh, they were coming over to his side. Um, it mentions uh, two thirds of the way down on 24, some brave and experienced warriors from the tribe of Gad also defected to David while he was at the stronghold in the wilderness. Okay, so uh, there, there are more Israelites coming over to David's side. Um, <laughs> this is an interesting note at the top of 25. These warriors from Gad were army commanders. The weakest among them could take on a hundred regular troops and the strongest could take on a thousand. So these were indeed mighty men. Then the next paragraph, others from Benjamin and Judah came to David at the stronghold. Then the spirit came upon Amasai, the leader of the 30, and he said, we are yours, David. We are on your side, son of Jesse. Peace and prosperity be with you and success to all who help you, for God is the one who helps you. So they're expressing allegiance to David as, he, as he's... Um, preparing to ascend to the throne of all Israel. Uh, so David let them join him, it says. He made them officers over his troops. Some men from Manasseh defected from the Israelite army and joined David when he set out with the Philistines to fight against Saul. Saul. Uh, so David, for a time, actually was with the Philistines. That, and we, we, we remember that from our earlier study. So again, uh, these were Israelites who technically should have been loyal to Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, uh, as, who, as I said, wanted to ascend to the, the king's throne. But uh, they were coming over in droves to support David and to, to fight with him. So th the handwriting was on the wall, so to speak, that David would ascend to the throne, that the kingship would not continue in Saul's line, but would be handed over to David. Um, uh, Three quarters of the way down, these are the numbers of the armed warriors who joined David at Hebron. They were all eager to see David become king instead of Saul, just as the Lord had promised. Okay. Um, the middle of 26, all these men, after listing uh, the men and where they were from, all these men came in battle to Hebron with the single purpose of making David the king over all Israel. In fact, everyone in Israel agreed that David should be their king. Okay, so uh, this was happening. David was becoming king over all Israel. Um, further on, it, it says uh, that after the break there on 26, David consulted with all his officials, including the generals and captains. He said, it is time to bring back the Ark of our God, for we neglected it during the reign of Saul. You remember the Ark of the Covenant? that God instructed Moses to build. It resided in the tabernacle, wherever the tabernacle went in the wanderings of Israel. And uh, you may remember that during a period of time uh, in Judges, when uh, Israel was away from God, uh, they were fighting the Philistines and they foolishly said, let's take the ark of God into battle. That's our good luck charm. Uh, well, and the ark was an important item in the tabernacle. You remember we, we showed you a picture of it way back uh, last year or the year before, whenever it was that we, we uh, did that part of the study. Uh, and it had the angels leaning forward over top, uh, covered in gold, and their wings practically touched. And it was said that God manifest his presence there on the top of the ark, on the lid of the ark, between those angels. So... It represented the presence of God. So Israel foolishly took it into battle, thinking of it as a good luck charm. God is not a good luck charm. God is with his people, uh, but uh, that's when they're faithful to him. And Israel was in a bad way. And so they foolishly took the ark into battle. They lost the battle. The Philistines uh, conquered uh, the Israelites at that time and took the ark. 
uh, and then they had their own problems with it, and it wandered into a town called Kiriath Jerem and stayed there for a number of years. So David, with a pure heart, is saying, we need to bring the Ark of God back. So says David and Israel went uh, to this town, Kiriath Jerem, to bring back the Ark of God, uh, and uh, they placed the Ark, this is significant, they placed the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it from Abinadab's house where it was staying. Uh, Uzzah and Ahio were guiding the cart. David and all Israel were celebrating before God with all their might, singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments, lyres, harps, tambourines, cymbals, and trumpets. So David was excited. The people were excited. They were celebrating. The ark of God is coming back to its rightful place. But did you notice something amiss? They placed the ark of God on a new cart. Say, so why is that significant? Okay, well, hopefully you remember, but if not, we'll, we'll uh, uh, remind you here in just a few minutes. But when, it says, when they arrived at the thre threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled, and Uzzah, one of the men guiding the cart, reached out his hand to steady the ark. So he touched the ark. Then the Lord's anger was aroused at Uzzah, and he struck him dead because he laid his hands on the ark. So Uzzah died there in the presence of God. David, it says, was angry because this happened, and so he named the place Perez Uzzah, which means to burst out against Uzzah. Then it says, David was now afraid, and he asked, how can I ever bring the ark of God back into my care? So David did not move the ark into the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. The ark of God remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months, and the Lord blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he owned. So in essence, after this happened, this tragedy, celebration turned to tragedy, Uzzah being um, stricken down by the Lord because he touched the ark, David said, you know, time out. Uh, and so they, they placed the ark in Obed-Edom's house, and God blessed Obed-Edom. Uh, with uh, his presence there. And David said, we, we have to look at this further. Well, uh, I mentioned the problem in the, that uh, caused this was in their method of transporting the ark. You remember that God had instructed Moses that poles were to be put through loops on the side of the ark and the Levites were to carry the ark whenever it was moved. Uh, so they weren't actually touching the ark, they were, they were uh, carrying it by these poles that would go through and several men would, uh, would carry the ends of the, would hold up the ends of the poles and transport it that way. Well, um, David in his enthusiasm, and I said before, his heart was in the right place and it was, but he didn't inquire how God wanted the ark transported and this tragedy occurred. So. The story, we'll get back to that a little bit later. Um, mentions then that King Hiram of Tyre sent messengers to David along with cedar, timber, stonemasons, and carpenters to build him a palace. Now that David was settled in uh, Jerusalem, what would be called the city of David, uh, it says, and David realized that the Lord had confirmed him as king over Israel and had greatly blessed his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. So a palace would be built for David there in Jerusalem. It says he married many more wives in Jerusalem. It was something they did back in that day. It wasn't necessarily, as a matter of fact, it wasn't God's perfect plan. We know that uh, from the Garden of Eden, God wanted one man with one woman, but uh, people did otherwise, and the scripture records that. And so David married wives. He had more sons and daughters. Um, Bottom uh, quarter of the page here on 27 says, when, da when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all Israel, they mobilized all their, all their forces to capture him. Uh, but David was told they were coming, so he marched out to meet them. This time, before this endeavor, David inquired of the Lord, should I go out to fight the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? The Lord replied, yes, go ahead and I will hand them over to you. Now, we're not told how the Lord spoke to David, communicated to David. Um, but the Lord communicated, yes, 
uh, go and fight them and you'll be successful. Uh, so David and his troops went up to Baal Perazim and defeated the Philistines there. I love this statement here in the last paragraph. God did it, David exclaimed. You know, sometimes when we set our hands to do something and God helps us and we're successful uh, in doing the Lord's work, sometimes we can get uh, a little bit proud and want to pat ourselves on the back. And we need to remember like David did that when something good happens and when something positive and uh, occurs in the kingdom of God and God uses us, we need to remember like David to say, God did it. It's not something I did. Yes, but perhaps I or others with me, we were obedient to the Lord. But in the end, God did it. I love that. Uh, when anything good happens, it's always good to say and to recognize God did it. Amen. Well, on the next page, 28, um, it says the Philistines, after a while, returned and raided again. Once again, uh, God, uh, David asked God what to do. And this time, God said, do not attack them straight on. Circle around them instead and behind them and attack them near the poplar trees. And listen to this. When you hear a sound like marching feet in the tops of the poplar trees, go out and attack. That will be the signal that God is moving ahead of you to strike down the Philistine army. So David did what God commanded, and they struck down the Philistine army all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. So God said this time, when David inquired, don't attack them straight on, go around, circle around near the poplar trees. And when you hear a sound, when the poplar trees are stirred, you hear a sound like marching in the tops of the trees, then know that that's the signal to go ahead and attack. Uh, and so God would send a wind to stir the trees. You know the sound. When there's a strong wind, uh, dense trees, uh, especially if they're close together, and they, they, when the branches are, are blown back and forth, they can make quite a sound. And uh, God likened it to the sound of soldiers marching. And so when they heard that, they were to attack, and they did just that. And again, uh, God helped them to win the battle over the Philistines. You know what that says to me? That you can't put God in a box. I, I often say we try and stuff God in a box sometimes and he won't go in that box. God is a God of variety. God is a God of the now. So many times we'll do something uh, and often at, at God's instruction or God's command and the Lord will perform a great miracle or come through or something awesome will happen. And we get in our human minds because we like we like ritual and we like patterns. Oh, okay, we did this last time. Let's do the exact same thing and we'll have the exact same result. And it may not be the case. Sometimes we could do the same thing and have success. But sometimes God may say, I want you to do it this way. And that underscores to me the importance of hearing the voice of God. Let's not try and go on automatic pilot and say, oh, we approached this situation this way before we did this and we were successful. Therefore, that's a pattern for all the future. No, not necessarily. The, 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 the real pattern is let's, let's hear from God. Let's get direction from God, whether that's in a church setting or a ministry setting or in your, our personal lives. Let's hear from God and go, hear what God has to say. I think that's a great lesson to learn here. So the, the note here uh, at the end of that paragraph, so David's fame spread everywhere and the Lord caused all the nations to fear David. So God was exalting David uh, in, uh, in the eyes of all the nations around him. Uh, we're continuing here with uh, our second session of Chronicles. Uh, great to have you all with us. Please feel free to share your comments or your questions during our time together as always. I love that you're here and uh, not, not everything has to come from me. Feel free to share your insights or if you have questions or comments, uh, we'd, we'd love to have you share them. Uh, continuing here on page 28, David now built several buildings for himself in the city of David. And he also, it says, prepared a place for the ark of God and set up a special tent for it. Then he commanded no one except the Levites may carry the Ark of God. Okay. You know, David was a lot of things. And as we know, he was imperfect, as we all are. He was not perfect. 
But da one thing David wasn't was stupid. <laughs> he wasn't a dummy. Okay. Now he says no one except the Levites may carry the Ark of God. He, they, he should have researched that earlier and avoided the tragedy that took place with Uzzah's life being taken. Uh, but now he said, we're going to transport the ark the right way. So it says he summoned all Israel this time to Jerusalem to bring the ark of the Lord to the place he'd prepared for it. Um, he summoned the priests, Zadok, Abiathar, and the Levite leaders. It mentions their names. He said to them, because you Levites did not carry the ark the first time, the anger of the Lord our God brushed out against us. We failed to ask God to move it properly. We failed. David owned up. And, and we know the story uh, from later on. We saw it in the, in the earlier study, how he sinned so miserably uh, with uh, Bathsheba. I referenced it tonight. And in Psalm 51, he pours out his heart uh, and, and, and asks for forgiveness and confesses his sin. But that wasn't the only time he did that. Uh, he says here, we failed. And he includes himself. To, we fail to ask God to move it properly. Boy, God loves that kind of an honest heart. Confession is good for the soul. And, and the word of God is clear. It's so important to confess our sin, confess our failures. Not in our pride, you know, double down as they say. But David, David didn't. And a lot of times what we do is we rationalize. Well, it was so-and-so's fault and somebody should have, David could have said, well, someone should have researched that, researched that initially and gotten back to me and this and that. And we rash, and, and we've all done it and we see it all the time. Let's stop rationalizing our sin before God and let's just acknowledge when we've blown it. And David said, we failed. We failed to ask God to move it properly. But he said, this time we're going to do it correctly. So he also, it says, ordered the Levite leaders to appoint a choir of Levites who were singers and mus musicians to sing joyful songs to the accompany accompaniment of harps, lyres, and cymbals. Um, you remember the, the Levitical tribe was responsible for the tabernacle and uh, its services and its furnishings and uh, the schedule of all the rituals and everything that took place there. They would be it later in the temple too. And so he uh, appoints uh, Levite leaders to uh, appoint a choir to sing joyful songs. And so um, middle, uh, a third of the way down on page 39 or 29, uh, David and the elders of Israel, the generals of the army, went to the house of Obed-Edom to bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant up to Jerusalem with great celebration. And because God was clearly helping the Levites as they carried the Ark of the Lord's Covenant, they sacrificed seven bulls and rams. Uh, but as the Ark of the Lord's Covenant entered the city of David, it says Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window. Now, Michael was David's one of David's wives. It says when she saw King David skipping about and laughing with joy, she was filled with contempt for him. So David was... Uh, celebrating, dancing, skipping around. Uh, First Samuel tells us he took off his outer robe, uh, his kingly robe, and he was making a spectacle of worshiping the Lord and celebrating. And his wife saw this and despised him. And we, we see from the other account that uh, she questioned him about it. Why were you making a fool of yourself? And David said, I'll make even more of a fool of myself to celebrate this great occasion. And it says because of Michael's complaint, she was barren uh, the rest of her life. She couldn't bear children. Uh, then it mentions the, the names of the Levites David appointed to lead the people in worship. Um, the bottom sentence on the page, on that day David gave, gave Asaph and his fellow Levites this song of thanksgiving to the Lord. Now Asaph is a name uh, you might see in your Bibles, in the Psalms, David was a musician, a minstrel. And uh, David, I mean, a uh, Asaph wrote a number of the Psalms. He's mentioned several times here in connection with uh, the worship. And so it says they composed this song. And it begins at the top of page 30. Won't read the whole thing. Um, trust that you've read it or will read it. But... Uh, just 
want to hit some highlights here. Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. Exult in his holy name. Remember the wonders he has performed. In the middle of the page, this is the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree. I will give you the land of Canaan as your special possession. Of course, the Lord kept that promise. Uh, bottom of the page, let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things he does. The gods of other nations are mere idols, but the Lord made the heavens. So David in this uh, and those with him in this song of praise, uh, he's really putting out some good theology, <laughs> okay? Um, tell everyone about the amazing things the Lord has done. The gods of other nations are mere idols, but the Lord made the heavens. You remember God told uh, Moses and Israel, the Lord your God is one God. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and he said, uh, you, you need to uh, imp impress that truth on your children. So David here is uh, saying it in another way, that, that God is the one who's made the heavens, but the, I, uh, the gods, the so-called gods of other nations are just uh, worthless idols. Page 31, let the heavens be glad, the earth rejoice, tell the nations the Lord reigns. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. We, we see that little couplet of praise in the Psalms many, many times. The very end of the section there, it says, and all the people shouted, amen, and praise the Lord. I'll tell you what, there's nothing as powerful as, as praise and just, just losing yourself and praising to God and praising God, it's, it's just powerful, powerful. And David understood that. Um, bottom of 31, David arranged for Asaph and his fellow Levites to serve regularly before the Ark of the Lord's Covenant, doing what needed to be done each day. Um, so he's reinstituting some of the tabernacle uh, rituals uh, surrounding the Ark now that it was back in its proper place. Meanwhile, David stationed Zadok the priest and his fellow priests at the tabernacle of the Lord at the place of worship in Gibeon, where they continued to minister before the Lord. Um, now, uh, on page 32, uh, we have the, the, the uh, beginning of an account that has to do with the future temple. It says, when David was settled in his palace, he summoned Nathan the prophet. Nathan figures a lot in the history of, of uh, King David. <clears throat> he said, I am living in a beautiful palace, but the Ark of the Lord's Covenant is out there under a tent. And so Nathan replied to David, do whatever you have in mind, for God is with you. Now that was, that was Nathan speaking. He hadn't had a word from the Lord for David, uh, but that was just Nathan sharing his own thoughts. So David's saying, you know, I have this beautiful palace, but God's, um, uh, you know, God's ark is under a tent. I want to build a permanent home for the ark. And Nathan just answering as, uh, you know, himself off the top of his head said, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it. But then it says that same night, God said to Nathan, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord has declared. And I won't read the whole thing, but I want to pick out a couple of, of points here and what the Lord told Nathan to communicate to David. You are not the one to build a house for me to live in. Okay? David had it in his heart, but again, it, it wasn't God's plan. And he's, listen to some of the things God says. I have never lived in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt to this very day. Of course, we know that God is um, everywhere. God is omnipresent. God uh, is not self-contained. Uh, so he said, I've, I've never needed a house. I've never once complained to Israel's leaders. He says, the shepherds of my people, why haven't you built me a beautiful house? Now go and say this to David. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture, selected you to be the leader of my people Israel. Been with you wherever, wherever you've gone. He makes some promises to David. I will make your name as famous as anyone who's ever lived on the earth. Wow, what a promise. I will provide a homeland for my people Israel. 
I will defeat all your enemies. And he says, furthermore, the Lord will build a house for you, a dynasty of kings. He says, David, you want to build me a house? I will build you a house, so to speak, a dynasty of kings. And we know that God promised that the kingship would never leave David's line, his, his line of descendants. And he said, but then he said, I will raise up one of your descendants, one of your sons, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for me. And of course, he's speaking of Solomon. So it says, Nathan went back to David and told him everything the Lord had said. And then David went in and, and David accepted that. You know, David didn't fuss and complain about what God had said and argue with God like we human beings want to do sometimes. He prayed a prayer of thanksgiving, said, Who am I, Lord God? What is my family that you have brought me this far? On 33, what more can I say about the way you have honored me? O oh Lord, there's no one like you. And now, Lord, I am your servant. Do as you have promised concerning me and my family. So David accepted the word of the Lord and gave the Lord thanks for his blessings and the promises that God made for the future of David's kingdom. Um, bottom of the page, David defeated and subdued the Philistines. David also, he defeated the Philistines quite a few times. Destroyed the forces of Ahadazer, king of Zobah. Um, he took the gold shields from Ahadazer's officers to Jerusalem with a large amount of bronze. This is a note here. Later, Solomon melted the bronze and molded it into the great bronze basin called the sea, the pillars, and the various bronze articles used at the temple. So there's a note projecting into the future. Middle of 34. So David reigned over all Israel and did what was just and right for all his people. Joab, son of Zariah, was commander of the army. Now, it moves on the bottom of 34 here, the bottom half of 34, to another incident. Uh, sometime after this, it says King Nahash of the Ammonites died. His son Hanun became king. David said, I'm going to show loyalty to Hanun because his father Nahash was always loyal to me. So he sent messengers to Hanun uh, to express sympathy about his father's death. But Hanun, uh, King Hanun of the Ammonites, his uh, advisors said, David's really sending these men to spy out the land. So it says they seized David's ambassadors, shaved them, cut off their robes at the buttocks, and sent them back to David. Uh, well, to uh, in that day, for a man's beard to be shaved was a great humiliation. It's not like today. And uh, so they were humiliated, and David told them to stay at Jericho until your beards grow out. It says, for they felt deep shame because of their appearance. So... Uh, it says Ammon realized how seriously that angered David. So basically they hired out uh, the uh, Arameans and some other peoples to fight against David because they knew David was, was not going to leave this, um, uh, this terrible thing that was done to his uh, messengers. He was not going to leave that unresponded un, uh, to. Um, and so... Bottom line is Israel went out and fought the Ammonites and the Arameans that they'd hired to fight with them. Uh, the Arameans, it says, realized they were no match for Israel. And um, Hadazer, the king of the Ammonites, uh, saw they'd been defeated and so they surrendered. Um, and so uh, David avenged uh, the um, uh, offense against his uh messengers. Uh, moving on here on 35, uh, says Joab led the army in successful attacks against the Ammonites. Um, David went to Rabbah and uh, removed the crown from the king's head and it was placed on his own head. So uh, David was blessed and God was with him. Um, a note on the top of 36, uh, El Hanan, son of Jair, in another battle with the Philistines, uh, killed Lami, the brother of Goliath of Gath. You remember, of course, David had slain Goliath as a young boy. Another battle with the Philistines. They encountered a huge man with six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot. 
but he was killed by Jonathan, the son of David's brother, Shimea. So uh, David's nephew, another nephew, killed this giant. They grew him big in, in, in Philistia. The Philistines did, didn't they? Well, uh, third of the way down in 36 is uh, uh, another failure of David's. It says, Satan rose up against him, to, uh, caused him to take a census of the people of Israel. So David told Joab and the commanders of the army, take a census of all the people of Israel. And Joab said, uh, my Lord, why do you want to do this? Why must you cause Israel to sin? Apparently, uh, God didn't want them, David, to do this. And, and this, this was an act of pride on David's part. But it says he insisted that they take the census and uh, reports the numbers there. And, and the bottom line, though, was that God was displeased with the census. One of the things I love about David, he was such a man after God's own heart, but we can relate to him because he blew it a number of times too. So God was displeased with uh, this, and then David said to God, here he is again, speaking the truth, I have sinned greatly by taking this census. Please forgive my guilt for doing this foolish thing. So David was repentant, but that didn't mean there wouldn't be consequences. So it says the Lord gave him three choices. You could choose as punishment three years of famine, three months of destruction by the sword of your enemies, or three days of severe plague throughout the land of Israel. Well, David said this is a desperate situation. You know, it's like one of those multiple choice questions when you took a test in school and you don't like any of the answers. You say, is there, <laughs> is there another choice? Is there a fourth choice, a fifth choice? Well, David, there were no good choices. But David said, let me fall into... God's hands, not human hands. So he he chose the the um, the devastation, the, the three days of severe plague. So it says the Lord sent the plague on Israel. Seventy thousand people died as a result, and then God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem. But as he was preparing to do that, it says the Lord relented and said to the death angel, "Stop! That is enough." I love this because even when God is meeting out a just punishment for David's sin and Israel's sin, even in the midst of his just punishment, you see God's mercy. Isn't God's mercy just amazing? And um, it says David saw the death angel uh, and uh, was fearful. So then the angel of the Lord told Gad, uh, a prophet, to instruct David to go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. Okay, this this man from Jerusalem, Aruna had a threshing floor, and a threshing floor was a flat, uh, open area on a plain where they could beat the wheat, thresh the wheat, and separate the chaff, the unusable part of the... Uh, of the wheat from the usable part. Uh, so, uh, so this threshing floor, David comes to Aruna and says, uh, let me uh, buy this threshing floor from you. And Aruna says, my Lord, the King, I will give it to you gladly. You can take it. And listen to what David says about two thirds of the way down on the page. No, I insist on buying it for the full price. I will not take what is yours and give it to the Lord. I will not present burnt offerings that have cost me nothing. So uh, David said, I'm not going to take the easy way out. I refuse to give God something that costs me nothing. There's a phrase we hear, and it's from the scriptures, called the sacrifice of praise. David said, I want to give God something of value, something that costs me something. Uh, what a lesson for us. I will not give God something that costs me nothing. You know, sometimes people donate things to the church and uh, sometimes they, they donate trash, <laughs> put it bluntly. Now, there's nothing wrong with used items if they're in good condition and can be used to give to the needy or uh, can serve a purpose at the church. I'm not, I'm not saying everything has to be new, but sometimes we've had people drop, meaning well, I'm sure, but you know, dropping off bags full of torn, uh, unusable clothing and, and other items. And I just want to say, why are you giving God your trash? God doesn't want your trash. 
God wants thing, us to give him things of value. God wants us to sacrifice for him. That's, that's an act of love. That's an act that means something. So David said, I'm going to buy the threshing floor. So it says he built an altar there and sacrificed burnt offerings and uh, peace offerings. And um, uh, then the Lord spoke to the angel who put sword back in his sheath. Uh, and then David said, this has a prophetic word. This will be the location for the temple of the Lord God and the place of the altar uh, for uh, Israel's burnt offerings. Uh, so, um, uh, I see, we see here somebody's putting uh, comments on here, on our page that don't belong here. And uh, we're having to take them out, so bear with me. Okay, uh, that's better. Um, so uh, David then set about the task of assigning people. David said, I accept that God will have my son in the future build a temple. I am not the one to do it. But David said, I want to prepare the way. I want to make preparations for the temple to be built. So he assigned people to prepare finished stone for the building, uh, provided large amounts of iron for nails, uh, gave more bronze than could be weighed. Um, so he collected, it says, vast amounts of building materials before his death. Then it says he sent for Solomon and uh, told him, my son, I wanted to build a temple, but God uh, said no, so you'll be the one to build it. May the Lord be with you, he said to his son Solomon, and give you success as you follow his directions in the building of the temple of the Lord your God. I've worked hard to provide materials for the temple. Um, now begin the work and may the Lord be with you. Uh, so David wasn't bitter that he couldn't fulfill his dream to build a temple. He accepted the work of the Lord, but he wanted to uh, prepare the way for his son Solomon uh, to build the temple uh, in obedience to the Lord. You know, there's a saying, uh, imagine the great things that can be done for God if we don't care who gets the credit. It's a great, powerful saying. And so... It, it, it was okay with David that he couldn't build the temple. He just wanted to see that it was done according to the word of the Lord. Then David, it says, ordered all the is leaders of Israel to assist Solomon in this project. So 39 then, when David was an old man, he appointed his son Solomon to be king over Israel. He summoned all the leaders of Israel with the priests and the Levites. Um, and uh, he organized the Levites to carry on the work of the temple. And it lists there the various duties. Uh, and uh, the three clans of uh, the three sons of Levi, Gershon, Koath, and Merari. It mentions people from those three clans. Of course, Le Le the tribe of Levi was, uh, which happens to be my grandson's name, by the way. Uh, the tribe of Levi was... The, the priestly tribe, Aaron was from the tribe of Levi, and so uh, the descendants of Aaron would be the priests, but not all, so not all Levites were priests, they had to be descendants of Aaron, but other Levites, other than Aaron's family, had their many, many duties surrounding the, uh, the worship of God in the tabernacle and then in the temple. Uh, on 40, it, it lists some of that work, the work of the Levites to assist the priest, uh, took care of the courtyards and side rooms. We touched on some of this last week. Performed ceremonies of purification, changed the sacred bread. The show bread was, was set out uh, fresh each day. They changed that. Checked the weights and measures, assisted with the burnt offerings. Uh, so the Levites, it says, watched over the tabernacle and the temple. Uh, so they performed these duties. They assisted the priests. Again, to be clear, the priests were, uh, were all priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests, if that makes sense. Uh, the, the, Le the priests were descendants of Aaron, who was from the tribe of Levi, but all priests had to be descended from Aaron. But other Levites who weren't ascended 
descended rather from Adam, uh, were uh, part of the, the Levitical tribe and they assisted the priests and performed other duties in the temple. And then, so a lot of these uh, Levites then are listed on page 41. It says each group carried out its appointed duties in the house of the Lord according to the procedures established by their ancestor Aaron in obedience to the commands of the Lord, the God of Israel. So uh, they would perform duties according to what God instructed Aaron, the first high priest, uh, to establish way, way back many, many years ago. Um, and then at the, the middle of 42, it mentions the army commanders appointing men from families of these various men to proclaim God's message to the accompaniment of lyres, harps, and cymbals. David, uh, even though he was a warrior, was very much um, focused on setting up the order of worship and the, the procedures and the people in place to conduct uh, worship. Um, and so uh, it, it, the bottom of 42, uh, it mentions these men under the direction of their fathers. They made music at the house of the Lord. They and their families were all trained in making music before the Lord. And each of them, 288 in all, was an accomplished musician. So these were trained, accomplished musicians. Why? Because the Lord deserves the best. And, uh, and, and so they were trained and they were made ready for their tasks. And then uh, the top part of 43 uh, lists um, those who were appointed to uh, serve in various capacities in this ministry according to sacred lots. And that finishes our material uh, for tonight. Uh, I trust this was a blessing to you. I would encourage you to uh, share any final thoughts or comments, any questions uh, here in the thread. As I always say, keep the conversation going, share your thoughts, and uh, let others benefit from seeing them. Uh, well, that concludes session two of Chronicles. We're moving right along, and uh, I trust uh, it's uh, been a blessing to you so far, and uh, we'll continue uh, next week. We'll pick up with session three. Let me say a word of prayer for you. God, thank you for the study this time uh, to uh, look into your word together. Bless each one who's been a part of this and those who see the recorded uh, video of it in the future and uh, let it be useful for your kingdom. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, I look forward to getting uh, together with you next time. Have a great rest of the evening and a great rest of the week. Good night.